one of We Move, which is the first of 25 sessions that will be basically showcasing the expertise of artists and technologists from all over the UK. And uh, for all of which who happen to be either women or gender minority, which is amazing. So, get my notes, <laughs> my very professional notes. Um, so we've done all of the housekeeping, which is delightful, and it means that you lot don't have to listen to it. Um, but just a couple of bits and bobs before we begin. Firstly, can we get a big hello for everyone who's watching the stream? <laughs> We're so glad that you're here as well. Um, and basically tonight we will be kicking off with composer, producer, performer, Helen Noir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Very excited to be here. And I'll do a, a tiny bit of embarrassing mm. of you, if that's okay. That's absolutely fine. Good. So, um, <laughs> firstly, Helen is a she-her and is a London-based soprano, composer, orchestrator and producer. She writes soundtracks for film, fashion, theatre, many exciting things. And most recently for Joseph Wilson's Isn't It a Beautiful World, which premiered at the BFI London Film Festival in October 2021. Um, she also performs regularly with Cult Performance Art Group, Theo Adams Company, and is an operatic session vocalist. That's true. <laughs> so tonight she's going to talk to all of us about modern orchestration, mm -hmm. and we are very grateful she's here. So now I will hand over to Helen. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really delighted to be the inaugural speaker for this series of events. Uh, there's going to be some amazing sessions in subsequent weeks, which I hope you'll come to as well. I certainly will come to some of them. Um, and thanks to Jenny and Music Hackspace and The Rattle for having me. Um, as Jenny said, I'm Helen. I'm a composer, soprano, mixer, producer, orchestrator, performer. Um, and I started composing by writing electronic music in Ableton. And then in recent years became more interested in writing for film, TV and um, uh, theatre. Um, and as I became more interested in writing for those areas, I found that it would be really helpful for me to be more versatile as a composer. Um, and that's what got me into orchestration, into writing for orchestral instruments and then becoming you know, kind of full on professional orchestrator. Um, I was working with producers and directors who really wanted their composers to be as versatile as possible. Um, they wanted people who were sort of a one-stop shop, so they would write the music, produce the, mil the music, mix the music, you know, everything was with that one composer. And while it's perfectly possible to have a very good career as a film composer and only write in electronic music, for me personally, particularly in the kind of low budget sorts of um, areas I was working, I really wanted to have as much versatility as possible. Um, and being able to write electronic music that had one or two orchestral instruments or being able to write for a full orchestra, you know, really kind of um, broadened my skill set in a way that I found really, really helpful. Um, I would say that, uh, I'm so sorry, what was I going yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry, we had so many tech issues before, they've really thrown me, but I will get back on track in just one second. Um, so, please don't judge me on the strength of this presentation, it's very basic, it's just some notes that you can take with you afterwards if you would like, um, and it's just for me to remind myself where I am at any point. Um, I would, my definition of orchestration is that it is the art and craft of notating music for orchestral musicians so that the music on the notated page as closely as possible resembles the music that the composer intended. And so that means understanding how 
individual instruments work, what articulations work for them, how to notate for their dynamics, how, what the strengths and weaknesses of each of those instruments um, is, and also how they work together um, as part of the orchestra. Um, there are surprising parallels between mixing and orchestration, and I personally think if you already mix or produce to a certain standard, you have transferable skills that you're probably not even aware of. And I'll point those out as I go through some of the things that I'm talking about this evening. Um, but it means that you know I started orchestration as someone who knew nothing about orchestration but had done quite a lot of production. Um, and I was surprised that not only with the tech that I was using to produce with sample libraries, um, I found that there was quite a lot of, of crossover in the actual kind of old-fashioned orchestration side of it, um, which, yeah, it's really interesting and um, means that you probably know more about orchestration than you realise. Um, when I first started orchestrating, I was kind of overwhelmed by how much there was to know, and I kind of had this very archaic idea that orchestrators were born and not made and that you know you kind of had to have this innate talent to do orchestration and it was something that maybe I would really struggle with and perhaps give up because I couldn't do it. Um, if you take nothing else away from this presentation I'd like you to realize that orchestration is a skill that can be learned by almost anybody I think. Um, and whereas it's very difficult perhaps you know very rare for people to start playing the violin for example at the age of 30 and become a concert standard violinist it is entirely possible for almost anyone to learn to orchestrate at any point in their career so it is absolutely a skill that you can learn um, I'm not gonna lie there is a lot of information there's lots and lots of detail about each of the individual instruments how they work together what their tonal blends are you know how you notate for each of them um, but as I hope you'll realize as I go through the, the concepts this, this evening, no one concept in orchestration is difficult. It's just lots and lots and lots of pieces of information. Um, and if you have the time and patience to learn those, you find that at some point they've just kind of coalesced in your brain and you have this like body of orchestral knowledge that you can draw on. Up to that point, you can refer to manuals or books or speak to you know, other orchestrators or speak to instrumentalists, you know, but nothing about orchestration is really difficult. It's just lots and lots of little details that you need to put together. Um, so yeah, I would really love you to think, to, to, to go away from this evening thinking that if this is something you'd like to get into, it's certainly something that you can master. Um, yeah. Uh, there is an awful lot of tech involved in modern orchestration, and some of that is probably what you'd expect. Um, we use um, notation software for making our scores, and so if you're going to be a professional orchestrator these days, you will need to learn some notation software, and I'll talk about that a little later on. Um, but fully half my job as an orchestrator is working with sample libraries and VSTs. Um, virtual software instruments and so there's an awful lot of production work um, that is required for modern orchestration uh, and there are a few different reasons for that um, one is that if you're working in film and television and you're lucky enough to be working on a production that has money for an orchestra you, you're going to be recording a real orchestra um, your director will need to know what that music is before you get into the recording session with the orchestra and so they will expect you to do a demo using sample instruments, which we call a mock-up. Um, and that demo will need to sound as close as possible to the music that is going to be recorded in the recording session. So your skills as an orchestrator are in notating that music, but equally they are in mocking up that music so that your director can sign off on, on the cue. Um, it's very, you can, I'm sure you can see that it's very important that those two things match. Um, if you write in your sample software, in your door, you write with your sample libraries and you write a cue that has, for example, you know, a huge brass section, it's a really big brassy sound, and your director falls in love with that, but you don't have the budget for a huge brass section in the orchestra that you're hiring, you know, you're going to find that the music you're recording sounds very different from the music that has been approved, and that can be a big problem. So as orchestrators for film and television, we are always, you know, trying to compare what we're writing, how will this notated music work in, in the real world? Will it sound like the music that I've made in my door, and vice versa? Um, you've probably heard a lot of orchestrated music in film and television that is made entirely from sample libraries, because this is kind of the flip side of working with sample libraries. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we're always aiming to make our sample library music as realistic and perfect as possible. Um, 
you never quite get there. <laughs> Um, sample libraries will never sound quite as good as real orchestras, although the people that do it really well, they make music in mock-up that sounds almost indistinguishable from the real thing. You know, even orchestral instrumentalists find it difficult to tell the two things apart. But in general, most of us kind of work to a certain standard, and I'll, I'll play you something in a little while that will give you an idea of the professional standard um, that you might want to aim towards. Um, so you... We, we make mock-ups if we're going to be using an orchestra, but we also increasingly make mock-ups that are the music that's used in the film and television program because um, increasingly directors want orchestral cues, but they may not be able to afford an orchestra at all. They still want that sound. So you've probably heard, particularly in lower budget pro um, programs in like high volume children's television, children's animation, in um, nature documentaries, the lower end of, that, of the scale of budget for those, those kind of things. You've probably heard full-on orchestral cues that are made entirely with sample libraries and have no real instruments at all. Um, so next time you're watching one of those, see if you can tell the difference. <laughs> and then we, there's a middle ground where we might use a combination of those things. So I might work with a director who really wants to work with strings and they can't afford a string orchestra. So I'll mock up the, um, the cue with a string library, a sample library, and then maybe we can afford uh, you know, a, a violinist, a violist, a cellist, and we'll get those people to play in real life. And we'll mix those two things together and it can really help kind of trick the ear and sort of elevate your um, half sample library music and make it sound more realistic. Um, that's one of the things that if you're working with an orchestrator, you're not interested in becoming an orchestrator yourself, but you're interested in being a composer who works with an orchestrator, um, that is one of the areas that they can help you with because they're able to advise you when it might be best to bring in a real musician. You know, what's going to be realistic with a, a sample library and what's really not going to trick anybody, what's not going to fool anybody. Um, so you might have a cue that has, for example, a quite a complicated cello part and some sim more simple kind of woodwind parts. Um, in that cir circumstance, you probably encourage the director to hire a cellist to play that difficult part and then the woodwind you might fake. Um, I wrote a cue recently that was for voice, violin, alto flute and bassoon and we could afford everyone to be real except for the alto flute but because everything else was real and the music for the alto flute was relatively simple everybody thought the whole thing was real. So there are ways of, of working with sample libraries to kind of you know help elevate the realism I mean, maybe it's trickery, but, you know, <laughs> it works. <laughs> uh, so that can be a really, really helpful way of working. And, yes, if you're working with an orchestrator, they can certainly help you to help to advise you on, on how best to use your resources. Um, I'm going to show you a piece of music that I wrote in a minute, the score, and I'm going to play it for you. Um, but I just wanted to speak very quickly about whether or not you need to read music, because um, this is something that comes up. If you're going to be an orchestrator, then yes, you absolutely have to be able to read and notate music at a, at a high level because that is a core part of your job. Just as if you were you know, a, a French translator, you would need to learn how to speak French fluently. It, it, there's no way around it. However, some composers don't read music and don't want to learn to read music, and I'm not here to argue with that. that that's your, if that's your choice, that's fine. Um, and if you're working in an improvisatory setting with a couple of musicians, you know, that can be a really dynamic and freeing way of working. Nothing ever goes on the page and you're developing a language between you and, you know, there's nothing wrong with working like that. That can be brilliant. Um, but if you're going to be working with a large ensemble or you're going to be working at a distance from a number of musicians, then if you're a composer who doesn't read music, you are going to need to work with an orchestrator who can translate for you. And I'm thinking in this case of people like Danny Elfman. Um, he's a very, very successful film composer who didn't learn to read music. He understands orchestration super well. He knows everything about it. But he needs to work with a team of orchestrators who will put his ideas on paper so that when they come to the recording sessions, and recording sessions for orchestras are ridiculously expensive. It costs about £35,000, I think, for a three-hour session at um, Abbey Road, one of those places. So you don't have time to be discussing what music you want to make. You just be, have to be able to make it as, as quickly as possible. Excuse me. A very dry mouth. As you might have been able to hear. Sorry, that's much better. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so 
If you don't want to learn to read music, for whatever reason, that's fine. If you don't read music and you're not learning it because you're intimidated by it, then just as with orchestration, I would say, don't let that be an issue. You know, I think learning to read music at any point in your career, if you want to, and I know, I realize it's easier for some people than others. It depends how, you know, how easily you know, you learn things that aren't on, on a printed page. But if it's something that you want to do, please don't be intimidated by reading music. Just as with orchestration, I don't want you to feel that it's something that is you know, only available to people with musical talent. It's, it's not. It's something that can be learned. And you can just start very slowly and, and you know, build your way up to it. To le- uh, okay, so um, that's not very high resolution. Let me just um, find a better version of that for you. Sorry. So this is a piece of music I wrote um, and notated. It is a fairly conventional um, piece of orchestration. There's nothing crazy about it. Um, it uses all of the instruments in a good part of their range. Sorry, I'm trying to get, yeah. Uh, in a good part of their range. Um, it uses the full orchestra. And I'll play you the music um, so that you have a sense of what a professional standard mock-up might be. Um, If you don't read music, don't worry. You don't need to. We're not going to go into the detail. Although I would just say, you know, talking about sort of chipping away at things and learning learning skills gradually, you know, just as you don't learn orchestration in a weekend, don't worry about learning to read music in a weekend either. It can be really helpful if you're starting to look at scores to even know little things like, you know, this is a double P, which means pianissimo, which is very quiet. This F is for forte, which means loud. This MP is mezzo piano, which is for, you know, moderately quiet. Even knowing something like that means that when you look at this score as I'm playing the music, you can start to understand how these swells are being interpreted by the musicians or why the musicians are making swells, crescendos and diminuendos where they are. Um, it can also be super helpful just to know where what rests look like. So um, the musicians here, that this is the second trumpet, uh, and they are not playing in these bars. Um, when you start score reading, and I'm going to talk about how valuable score reading is a bit later on, you know, um, just being able to look at a score, even if you don't read music and listen to the music as, it, as, as you're watching the score, it can be hugely instructive just to be able to see, okay, well, the winds and the strings are playing in this section. I can see that the brass and everyone else is quiet, and that's why this kind of sound is happening. That's why this kind of tone color is, is occurring. And on the next page, I can see the strings are playing with the percussion, and everyone else is quiet. You don't need to know what the notes are in order to start interpreting you know, whole pages of music and start to be able to decipher why certain orchestrations work, why certain combinations of, of instruments work really well together. And this is the first way in which I think orchestration is like mixing Um, because in orchestration we're always talking about tone color which is what combination of instruments produces what kind of 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 tonal quality what kind of balance what kind of texture Um, and the more you know about that the better you are as an orchestrator because you're able to pull colors from different uh, instruments and combine them together and it's really a very mixily skill if that's a word Um, it's very similar to EQing you know, a, a selection of tracks. You've got things that you, you want them to go together in a certain way, so you're going to use a synth that has this kind of tone to it, or you're going to use a bass guitar that has this kind of tone. You know, this kind of thing is key to orchestration, but it also has parallels, I think, in mixing. Uh, so I'm just going to play this music. Sorry, we had so many tech issues before, so everything's in different bits of um, my section. But this is the music, um, and this is not the best... Uh, mock-up in the world it's certainly not the worst but this would be of a standard that I could give to a director for them to sign off on um, and it's entirely made with sampled instruments
chair so we could probably then get some weird dance music otherwise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you'll note with that music, um, if you do read music or if you're following along, the mock-up very closely resembles what's happening on the page and vice versa. You know, I have written that, I have scored that music so that there is a, a, a similarity between them. And if we went into a recording studio and recorded that piece of music, the director would end up with something that sounds better than what's um, in that mock-up because it's real instruments, but is of a piece. They're not going to go, yeah, that's not what I was expecting at all. Um, and so, you know, this is one of the things that we're always doing as modern orchestrators. We are referring back from our scores to our sample libraries and vice versa and trying to make sure that those two things resemble each other really, really closely. So if I notate this music badly, if I don't put the dynamics in precisely enough, if I score for the wrong instruments, um, you know, beyond even having the right notes. If I haven't notated it carefully, then I'll find that the music that's being played by real musicians won't match what I've got in my mock-up, and then I've got a problem with my director. Um, for those of you who do read music, I'm just going to point out a couple of things to do with um, this score that probably look a little different from regular um, uh, orchestral scores that you might have seen in the past, and that's because it's written with film score conventions. Don't worry if this doesn't make sense to you, it's just for those people who might be a bit confused at the moment. So you'll see that in film and television scores, we use these giant time signatures um, because everything needs to be as clear as possible for your conductor. So there's absolutely no question what the count is. <laughs> and that's why we do that. And you'll also note that we do scores in C or um, open key. And that means we don't use key signatures. You don't see anything here. That doesn't mean you can't write in keys, you absolutely can. This piece was very tonal, for example, but we individually notate each sharp and flat as an accidental through the, through the score, and that's film and television convention. Um, it means that I've kind of forgotten how to read key signatures now. <laughs> <laughs> so when I come back to doing opera music, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that's why, you know, so in case that seemed confusing to you. I'm just going to run through, you know, the, um, this is a standard Western orchestra and this is a standard instrumentation for a standard Western orchestra. So I'm just going to run through the instruments for those who may not be familiar with them. There are lots of other Western instruments that you can use in an orchestra. Um, and please don't be afraid to write for them, that's absolutely fine. But this is what's kind of in, in the standard orchestral setup, so I just want to talk about those very quickly. Um, at the top of the page, you'll see this is a woodwind family, um, and it starts with flute. There's often piccolo as well, then oboe, clarinet, and bassoon. Under that will be the brass family, which is French horns, trumpets, trombone, bass trombone if you have one, and tubers. Then you have um, timpani under that, and in the orchestra, the timpanist is generally a specialist and doesn't play anything else. Um, and then you have percussion underneath that. And percussionists, you know, the number of the percussion instruments used will vary wildly. Uh, percussionists are amazing. They're uh, some of the most versatile musicians in the world because they play an enormous variety of instruments with equal skill. It's really quite astounding. So they will play things that you s expect them to, you know, things that are struck and hit like gongs and triangles and drums. Um, they also play things with piano style keyboards like celesta. Um, they play tuned percussion with up to four mallets, two in each hand, like xylophone and vibraphone. Um, yeah, so the range of percussion instruments that you can routinely ask for, you know, is only really limited by your budget. There are so many different things you can use, and you will find that professional percussionists can play all of them um, and play them in ways that you wouldn't expect as well. They'll be, oh, do you want me to do this? And you'll be like, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted. To. It's, like, it's really, really amazing musicians. I mean, they're all amazing musicians in the orchestra, but yeah, percussionists, I'm have a special love for. Um, and then below the percussion section, you will have the piano if you've got one, and then your harp, and then your um, string family. Um, and from smallest to largest, that's violins. In the standard Western orchestra, we have two sections of violins. Then you have violas, then you have cellos, then you have basses. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the numbers of those might be uh, something like 10 first violins, eight seconds, six violas, six cellos, three basses. Those numbers vary, but they'll always be larger for the violins and then decrease down to the um, basses. And that's so we can keep the dynamic balance the way that we expect. Um, and this is the next thing I wanted to talk about, <coughs> the next aspect in which um, orchestration is similar to mixing, and that is 
dynamic balance. We talk a lot in orchestration about balancing the orchestra, which means making sure that the volume balance is how we want it at any point in time. And that's such a mixerly, producerly thing to, to talk about, you know. So you want to make sure at any time that, you know, you have the dynamics from the different sections of the orchestra the way you want so that the instruments that are loudest and you want them to be loud that's great if you want them to be quieter and you can't hear another section then you need to rebalance by putting in different dynamics or, or if you're working live sometimes it's by asking a section to be quieter but this idea of balancing the orchestra as well as this idea of mixing tone colors you know those are the two main ways i think in which you know orchestration is very very similar to mixing and if you already understand a lot of that because you have been EQing bass lines and making them balance with your kick drum you have uh, skills in orchestration that you didn't realize that you had and i think that can be really empowering when you start working in orchestration um, so we're going to run through um, quite a few basic um, principles of orchestration and these are things to keep in mind whether you're working with real musicians or whether you're working with sample libraries. Um, if you want to work with sample libraries and make unrealistic music, that's absolutely fine. You know, I'm not going to stop you from doing that. You can make music that no real orchestra would be able to play and that might be what you want to do. You know, go for it. Absolutely fine. But if you are making music with a sample library such that it's going to be played by real musicians or it has to match with some level of realism what a real musician would be able to do, then you're always thinking, how would this instrument work in the real world and, and vice versa? Because it is so easy with sample libraries to write music that is um, at worst, you know, sorry, at best just difficult and at worst literally impossible to play. Um, and lots of people, when they start writing for orchestral instruments, don't keep these things in mind and give music to musicians that is just baffling. You know, they, they, they either find it incredibly difficult or they literally cannot play. <laughs> I'll explain that. I'll explain some of those things. Um, so the, the absolute first thing you need to keep in mind is, I think this might be really difficult to see. I wonder if I've got a better version of it. Um, sorry, this resolution's really low on this. Nope. Nope. There we go. That might be a little bit easier to see. I can't actually see it myself. Um, the absolute first thing to keep in mind when you're writing for an orchestral instrument is the range that it can play. Because if you write outside the range, the musician will not be able to play that music. And I know that sounds super basic, but I've seen this happen. I've seen somebody given music that is too low for an instrument and they kind of expected the instrumentalist to sort of find some work around. You know, it doesn't, <laughs> there's no way of doing it. You have to, at the most basic level, write music that is playable by your instrument. Um, I'm going to see if my Cubase session is working. So we, this is the thing we had loads of tech issues with earlier. Um, let me see if I can make this work now. Okay, it seems to be happy. Everyone cross everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I'm getting no sound out of that whatsoever. Okay. I did have some beautiful sound examples for you. Um, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to verbally describe them and you're going to have to take my word for it on certain things. Um, so I'm really <laughs> sorry about that. But everything I'm saying is true. Um, okay, so if you take um, a, an instrument like the violin, for example, the lowest note that violin can play is a G below middle C. And that is because if it's standardly, uh, standardly? If it's tuned to standard tuning, the, the, the biggest string, the, um, the open string, when it's, it doesn't have any fingers playing notes on it, will be tuned to a G. If you write music below that G, your violinist will not be able to play it. Um, but that G is... It's a great note. You can write for that note, and your violinist will play it. They'll be very happy to play it. It will sound beautiful because, you know, that, that string is an accessible note. That part of the range, although it's the absolute lowest part of the range, it is a note that your violin can play. So when you're learning the, the range of the violin, you learn that's the lowest note, and that's fine. The uppermost note on the violin is somewhat negotiable. So virtuosos will be able to play better, higher. And so when we write for the upper range of the violin, we, ba we talk about a kind of effective range. We, there's a note or, or notes above which we don't write unless we've got a really good reason for doing so, unless we know that we're working with somebody who can, who can play those notes. So for the violin, the, the range is, you know, there's an accepted range and it has an absolute lowest note. It has a kind of negotiable 
upper note. So we talk about effective range in, in, in that case, and we need to be sensitive to that when we're writing for violin. Um, working with software instruments, this is one of the places where they can trick you, because every note across the range of that software instrument will sound equally good. So the very highest notes on the violin will sound as good as the lowest notes on the violin. And if you're working with an, a sample instrument and you don't know the peculiarities or the idiosyncrasies of the real instrument, then you're going to write music that might be difficult to play. For wind and string, sorry, for wind and brass instruments, both ends of the range are often a little fuzzy. You know, some players will be able to play low notes really well. Some players will be able to play high notes really well. Um, so we talk again about absolute range for um, brass and wind instruments, but then we we have a kind of come in. <laughs> Lovely to see you. Come in. <laughs> we have a kind of effective range that we that we write for. Um, and so if I was writing in the lowest part of a trumpet range, for example, I could have notes that that trumpet can play, and if I write them in my door, they all sound beautiful. They sound, you know, maybe I want to write a, a slow, quiet passage in the, the bottom notes of the trumpet, and I'm like, oh, that sounds gorgeous, it sounds fantastic. I give it to my trumpet player, and it doesn't sound as beautiful as I expect. You know, it's a little raspy maybe, and a little uncertain, maybe the tuning's not that great, depending on the player. Um, and that's because I haven't considered where in the range I'm writing for. You know, I've written on my, on my door, everything sounds amazing, everything sounds equally good at any part of the range, but my real trumpet player isn't able to play those notes as well as I might want them to. And if I was being a good orchestrator, I would think, do you know what? I'm not going to give those notes to a trumpet, I'm going to give them to a trombone. Because tonally, trombones and trumpets are very similar. You can kind of think of a trumpet as a high trombone in, you know, tonally, not in, every, in the way it's played, but in, in the way it sounds. But those notes that are low, very low for a trumpet, are right in a good range for a trombone. And they're going to sound really pure, and, you know, that trombonist will be able to play those notes long and slow and the way that I've written them. So good orchestration isn't just about knowing the range of your instrument, but about knowing where things sound good within that range and what might be easy. Um, I'm not saying never write difficult music, you know, there's, but, but if you're going to write difficult music, have a reason for, being a dif for it being difficult. You know, have thought about it and gone, do you know what, there's no other way of me getting this to sound the way that I want. Um, don't just write music that is difficult because you haven't thought about how the instruments work in real life. Um, so you'll see in the second column here, and I know this is really fuzzy, but there's a link for this, and everyone can have this handout uh, um, afterwards. There's a link for this page. Some kind person put this on the, on the internet so you can download it and look at it in much better resolution in the comfort of your own homes. Um, you'll see that next to the absolute range for the instruments, we have this section that's marked timbral characteristics. Um, if you're playing a synth, unless you've got some weird filter that changes with, you know, makes the note change with pitch, your synth has the same timbral characteristics anywhere in its range. It's the same kind of sound, just played higher or lower. Orchestral instruments sound different at different parts of their range. And as you learn to orchestrate, you learn where in the range instruments will sound a particular way. So um, I can barely read this myself, but I'm, I'm going to do this by me from memory. <laughs> Flutes and piccolos, for example, in the low part of their range, they sound really gorgeous and warm, but it's a kind of hollow sound. It doesn't project very well. As you move up the range, it becomes brighter and more piercing. And at the very top of their range, you have this really piercing quality, and you know, it, can, it, it can almost sound quite shrill. So you need to be aware not only of the absolute range of your instrument, but of what the instrument's going to sound like at different parts of its range. So again, as I was saying before, you know, <laughs> None of these concepts, I don't think, are difficult, but there's just lots of detail that if you're going to be a good orchestrator, you need to start putting this together. Um, but you do that gradually, you know, that you can refer to these kinds of charts to begin with. You can speak to your, to your instrumentalist. Just be aware that instruments won't sound the same in every part of, your range, of their, ra their range. So if I wanted to write a piece of music that I wanted to sound really moody and somber and kind of dark and dramatic, I'm not going to use a piccolo at the top of its range because it's going to mm -hmm. sound shrill and bright. You know, so those characteristics aren't going to work for the music that I'm, that I'm writing. Um, there is a really lovely chart that I can't give you to download because it's, um, it's copyrighted, but I do want to show it to you. Um, so this was made by quite a famous orchestrator, and this is great if you're a visual learner. There's a link to where to download this. I think it costs about £12 um, in my notes. Um, and you'll see that he has broken down um, 
instruments into their ranges, but he's also colour coded what instruments sound like at different parts of their range. And you can quite literally go through and go, I want to write a piece of music that is, you know, bright and brilliant. So I'm sort of going to just match up where the yellows and whites are in the chart. You know, it's a really great way of kind of becoming familiar with how instruments sound at different parts of their range. Um, yeah, and it's not necessarily where you would expect. So some of the bigger instruments sound shrill and bright at lower pitches than some of the higher instruments. So um, matching those instruments up, you might not, you might think I can only use instruments that play very high, and that's not necessarily true. You can still get that kind of timbre quality at other parts in the range. So this is a really useful chart, and if you are serious about getting into orchestration or learning a bit more about how instruments work, that can be super, super helpful. Uh, where is my... Slideshow. Okay. Um, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do at all. I wanted to go that way. Yeah, <laughs> so absolute range. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is relative volume, um, which is another important concept um, and something that doesn't occur with um, with with mixing with synth necessarily, so if I've decided maybe that I want to write for a flute and um, and trumpet because I like the sound of those two instruments and I'm going to mix them together, so I'm going to write um, a loud note for my flute, um, an E above middle C, which I've ch I've checked my ranges, I know my instruments well enough to know that that's a really easy note for a flute to get. I'm not giving it an impossible note, um, and I'm going to match that with a unison um, a trumpet note, also played loudly. So I balance those up in my door, and I can hear the flute equally as loudly as I can hear the trumpet. They both sound great. And I write that in my notation software, trumpet loud, flute loud. And then I give them to my real players, in the, and in the room, all I can hear is trumpet. And that is because a loud trumpet is always going to drown out a loud flute, particularly at that part of the range. So the next layer of complexity, you know, once you've learned kind of absolute range and you've started thinking about what instruments sound like in different parts of their range is how loud instruments are, what their relative dynamics are to each other. The brass family in general can blast the entire rest of the orchestra out of the water. You know, if they are really going for it, really, really playing loudly, you won't be able to hear anybody else. And that might be what you want. You might want that sort of huge, gorgeous, you know, glorious brass sound that you can, you can only get with a brass section really going for it. But you need to know that that's what you're scoring for and you haven't accidentally got that because you've given them all the wrong dynamics and you can't hit anybody else. And this goes back to that concept of balancing the orchestra, which you know is akin to mixing. We, you, you're always thinking about where the relative volumes are of different, in, of different sections and different instruments and what you've told them to do in order to kind of you know, get them to sound the way that you want. So I might go back to my door and go, okay, fine. You know, obviously that didn't work, so I'd still like to keep my flute and trumpet. So I'm going to just turn down the trumpet in my mix. Um, and if you're mixing with synths, for example, and you want that synth to be quieter in the mix, you turn it down. And it sounds the same. It's got exactly the same timbral qualities. It's just louder or quieter. So I've done that with my trumpet. Uh, and I've decided that that's a quiet trumpet. And so I change my score and write, now the trumpet's playing quietly. And I have those musicians play that in real life. And I'm going to be able to hear my flute and my trumpet separately, but the trumpet's going to have an entirely different quality to the sound. It's not going to sound like a quieter, loud trumpet, if that makes sense. It's going to sound like a quiet trumpet. Um, so not only do orchestral instruments change their timbre where they are, depending on where they are in their range, but they change their timbre depending on what dynamic they're played at. Um, and that's great because you have this huge variety to play with and it's you know, another way of, um, of expanding the tone colours that you can use. You, know, you mix all of these... I, I score quite a lot for, for low flute. It sounds gorgeous. But I have to mix it with quieter other instruments. If I'm going to mix it with brass, they better be playing super softly. And that can be beautiful tone colour, but I need to know that. And I also need to be aware that it's not just going to sound like a trumpet turned down. It's going to sound like an entirely, not like a different instrument, but by like it's going to have an entirely different quality from a loud trumpet. Okay, so back to my door. I'm like, okay, well, that didn't really work out the way I wanted. I definitely want the sound of loud trumpet. So what am I going to do? Um, I would probably at that point decide that I'm, I still want to keep the flute, but I'm going to put the flute up an octave. So you're still maybe not going to be able to hear the flute super distinctly, but suddenly you've got the flute at a bright, more piercing part of its range, 
Um, and you'll find that you get this blended quality, this blended tone color of trumpet and flute that's not like either of them by themselves. Um, and it sounds really beautiful, and that might be something that I want to use. I might decide to dispense with um, flute altogether and mix the trumpet with an oboe at the same pitch. And that's going to create another tone quality. It's going to take some of the brassiness out of the, the trumpet. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's going to create a, a, a note with a tone quality that doesn't sound like uh, either like oboe or like trumpet, but like some combination that only they can produce together. So learning what these combinations are is something that we are continually doing in orchestration. You never learn all of them. Um, <laughs> And one of the exciting things about working with new orchestrators or new composers is they've often mixed together um, instruments in ways that you wouldn't have expected. And you're like, oh my God, the tone color of this with this is really beautiful. And like, I'd never thought to do that. You know, it can be really exciting. It's kind of like an endless thing. Um, and there are um, fashions in tone color as well. So you'll notice through the, if you, if you start listening to a lot of historical music, you'll realize that the quality of certain eras, the quality of a lot of classical music, for example, a lot of Baroque music, depends on the kind of, of um, instruments that they combine together at that time um, and where they put them in the, in the spectrum. So, sorry, in the, in, yeah, in the spectrum. So, so what kind of tone qualities you're getting from the combination of those instruments. That can be really, really interesting. Um, yeah. So, timbral qualities, relative volumes, um, color and tone, all really, really important things. The next thing I wanted to mention, and this is incredibly basic as well, but it gets ignored so often, is that whereas string players can go on for pages and pages and pages without, um, I mean, they need to breathe to live, but they don't need to breathe <laughs> in order to keep <laughs> playing their instruments, you know? <laughs> they can breathe while they're playing their instruments. Okay, Brass and wind players need to breathe in order to play their <laughs> instruments because at some point they're going to run out of breath. And when you're writing with um, VSTs and sample libraries, it's really easy to write passages that go on and on and on, or notes that are far too long. Um, and then you give those scores to your real players and they can't do anything with them, or they're just exhausted the whole time. Um, not only do they need to breathe, but they also need to have time to rest, um, both their vocal apparatus or their breathing apparatus, but also their lips. Because um, brass and wind players do a lot of manipulation of notes with their lips, and these little muscles get tired really quickly. So if you're doing you know, quite a long, fast passage for a wind player, even if you've given them time to breathe, you probably need to give them a couple of bars where they can just have a little breather, <laughs> just have a little rest and recuperate and then go on again, and they'll really thank you for doing that. Again, it doesn't mean that you can't write difficult music, but if you are going to write difficult music, do it with intention and do it because there's a musical reason for, for, for you to have written it in a difficult way. Um, I wrote a wind piece recently that had all these long kind of languid lines that ran into each other and, you know, there weren't many places to breathe and I knew that and I kind of needed them to, like, have these long, long breaths. But the whole piece was only 45 seconds long, so I knew that my players looking at that would go, oh, okay, all right, there's not that much of it. You know, I can mitigate for that. I can, like, you know, I can, I, I know that it's coming up and I know that I'm going to need to conserve my breath, but I also know that it's going to be over quite soon. Um, <laughs> which I hope isn't what people think of my music in general, but anyway. <laughs> but for that particular piece, in terms of breathing, <laughs> and it meant that um, the, the musicians could see there was a reason why I'd written it that way. You know, it was probably the only way I could get the music to sound like that, but I had taken them into a consideration. I hadn't just written that for them as if they were, you know, autom automatons. Um, and if I had just written in my door without thinking about it, I might have had that piece go on for a lot longer. Um, idiomatic writing, again, I was going to give you some examples um, in, in Cubase, but I, I can't do this, so I, it's just going to be verbal examples. I'm <laughs> so, um, idiomatic writing means that you're writing for your instrument in a way that makes sense for that instrument. Not all music can be played equally well on different instruments. And that's not a shortcoming. It can very much be a strength, but you need to be aware of it. Um, so writing the same way, the same music for all instruments can be a real problem. Um, and some of the best composers um, have issues with this. You know, Bach, who's an amazing composer, is often criticized for writing non-idiomatically. So he writes for voice, for example, in the same way that he writes for keyboard and doesn't do those basic things like give singers like me time to breathe. You know, <laughs> So you have these long, long phrases that aren't written idiomatically for voice necessarily. They're more like, like keyboard lines. Um, a common mistake might be something like writing for the harp as if you were writing for the piano. Um, harpists play with four fingers and pianists play with five digits. 
So if you are just moving your piano music to harp automatically, it's either going to be difficult to play, unnecessarily difficult, or it could be impossible, depending on how you've written it. So that kind of thing is really important. Um, glissandos, another issue. Um, so if I'm writing a glissando, you know, a, a slide that goes, hmm, um, on a string instrument, and I want it to be a true glissando, I'm going to make sure that the starting note and the ending note of that glissando are on the same string, because string players do do kind of fake glissandos where they switch strings, but it's not going to sound exactly the way I want. So if I've written in my door and I haven't thought about how the real instrument is going to be played, I could write, very easily write glissandos that aren't going to translate well to the real world. Um, writing for trombone. It's very idiomatic to write, um, you know, those kind of slides for trombone. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they sound like, I'm sure, but you know what I mean. <laughs> those kind of slides for trombones, you know, they're brilliant. S trombones do those really, really well. That's a very idiomatic thing to do. But they can't play between every note and every other note. There are only certain slides that they can achieve um, because of the way their instrument works. So you need to know what those are. Um, and I don't necessarily mean you need to memorize all of these. You know, I certainly haven't memorized every, you know, possible note interaction on every kind of trombone. But I know that it's an issue. And so if I'm writing slides for trombones, I'll check with a trombone player or I'll check with one of my, note, my um, you know, notation handbooks or something. It's, a lot of this is just knowing that it could be an issue. You know, and so if you're going to be orchestrating yourself, these are the kinds of things you want to talk about, you want to think about. If you're going to be working with an orchestrator who's going to be interpreting your music for, um, for the notated page and for your musicians, then it's really good to know that these are the kind of things they might bring up so that you're not surprised and you're not you know, confused about why the music that you've written might need to be amended before it can be given to real musicians. Um, articulations. I think I can show you this um, in Cubase. Maybe, oh, oh, maybe not. So articulations are the ways in which an instrument can be played. Um, and your sample libraries, if you're using a professional sample library, they will come with a standard set of articulations. And it is reasonable to ask a professional player to play in any of those ways. They will all know how to do it. So unfortunately, because we don't have audio, I can't play these for you. But for a violin, for example, you know, some of the standard articulations are sustain, which is the, the kind of typical bowing sound that you would hear. Tremolo, which is where they move the bow rapidly back and forth. Um, uh, Marcato, which is the same as, uh, it's, it's a bowed note, but they have a very sort of heavy attack at the beginning of the, bow, of the, of the note, so they have this like a aggressive sound to it. Staccato, and there are different kinds of staccatos, those are, are different short notes. Harmonics, which are essentially playing overtones of the note. Um, and pizzicato, which is where they pluck the, the note with um, a fingernail, so you get a plucked sound. And it would be reasonable for me to ask any professional violinist to play with any of those articulations. Those are, those are all completely standard. Um, so learning what articulations work for what, 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 sorry, what articulations are possible for each instrument is part of learning how to orchestrate. Um, and if you're working with an orchestrator, your composer who doesn't orchestrate yourself, um, you might often find that the orchestrator will suggest using articulations that you haven't thought of. And that might mean that your players suddenly become more flexible um, than you realized, and you might uh, need fewer of them because you can get different sounds out of the instrument that you expected. Um, you'd be surprised how many people think that string instruments can be bowed and that's all they know about. Um, mm. uh, if, if you've only ever heard them played like, like that, you know, this, that's probably why you don't realize there's a whole, a whole list of other articulations. But there are lots and lots of things that uh, instruments could do. Um, so when you're working with an orchestrator, you know, do think to ask, like, is there something else that I can ask this instrumentalist to do um, that they'll be happy to do for me? There's also a set of things called extended techniques, which are articulations that aren't standard. Um, and sometimes over time they kind of become standard because everyone thinks to use them. Um, if you're working with uh, musicians and you would like them to do things that are beyond the standard repertoire, that can be absolutely fine, but you need to discuss it with them in advance because they will have different abilities to, or different willingnesses often to try different things. If you're working in a commercial setting, you normally wouldn't score for an extended technique because you don't know if the instrumentalists are going to just be able to pick the music up and play it. You know, so you would use those for a kind of more experimental, or smaller recording session or for a group of musicians that you knew already understood what you wanted to say. 
Um, and yeah, the last thing I wanted to talk about with basic orchestration principles is writing pianistically. And I can't play you the examples, unfortunately, but um, hopefully I can explain what I mean. So if you've been a singer-songwriter for a long time or you've been writing for synths, you're probably very used to playing your keyboard in this way. You know, so your chords have quite close voicings. They're not too far away from each other. And you're probably using your left hand with a kind of octave span. You might move up and down, but you're not using the entire keyboard. Um, and if you suddenly start writing for, st say, a string orchestra, for example, there's nothing wrong with writing those kind of chords. They can sound fine, but you're not taking advantage of the full frequency range that the string orchestra can play. Um, and you probably want to think about expanding, you know, and putting notes in the basses that are much lower than you would if you were writing, you know, for a, a song accompaniment. Um, and then moving things up the range so that the, vi the first and second violins are very much you know, several octaves away from where the basses are. Um, so you get this huge, gorgeous string sound. String instruments in general blend together with each other really, really beautifully. Um, and yeah, as I said, you can choose to write very close voicings and that might be, you know, the musical intention that you, that you wanted any, at one point in time. But don't ignore the fact that instruments have this huge um, spectrum that you can play on. Okay. So if you're starting to learn to orchestrate, what should you do? I would suggest starting with um, learning a notation software, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But start with one instrument. Um, don't start trying to write for orchestra all at once. So pick something from the, the wind family. You know, pick the flute, um, pick the trumpet, pick the cello. You know, and 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 learn what the, the articulations are for that instrument, what the range it can play. Listen to lots of music that's written for that instrument. Really get a familiarity for it and when you feel that you know it a little bit and you've written some things that, that make sense for it, you can start to either write for more instruments in that same um, group or you can write for, for an entire group, you know, so write for the wind family, write for the brass family um, and you'll gradually find that you're able to kind of bring all these things together and you're suddenly writing for an entire orchestra and you didn't think you'd ever be able to do that and that's really exciting. <laughs> um, use the sample libraries that come with your door to begin with. I'm not suggesting that anyone should go out and buy every sample library um, initially you will find that they don't have the capabilities that you want as you get further into orchestration. But, you know, work with them first. There's quite a few free VSTs and sample libraries, and I've given some links to some of the good ones um, at the back. It's not an exhaustive list. There are others that you can find. But, yeah, definitely don't spend any money initially until you know that you want to move forward with, with learning to orchestrate. Um, when you are ready to move on, I would say get one good all-round orchestra, like Spitfire's um, BBC SO, um, and or if you don't want to get a, a, an all-rounder, get one good library for each of the sections. So get one good string library, one good wind library, one good brass library, um, and maybe one good orchestral reverb. Um, but yeah, don't buy all of the libraries. Um, there's kind of this thing, as there is in any area of production where you know everybody needs to have all of the libraries, um, and it's very expensive. They cost a lot, even when they're on sale. Um, I've heard mock-ups made with fully £20,000 worth of sample library and they don't sound as good as somebody who's got one or two and knows how to use them really, really well. Mm -hmm. So just as you don't need all the plugins, you know, you don't need to buy all the EQs in order to start mixing, you know, it's, it's better to work with the ones that you know really well and then build on, build on that um, when you're ready, you know, when you really feel that you're, you've reached the limit of the um, instruments that you have, then get something else in, but don't worry about it initially. Um, and then I would also say score read. Score read is the absolute best way to learn orchestration. And um, we all do it whatever level of orchestration we're at. You know, really experienced orchestrators still, still score read. You know how when you're working with a producer and if you're geeky like me and you hear a really great vocal, you're like, oh, you want to know what the vocal chain is. You're like, okay, what preamp did you use? <laughs> and what, what, what mic did you use? And all that kind of thing. You know, it's kind of like that with orchestration. If we hear music that we really love, we want to see the score because we're like, oh, I think this is what's playing. But oh no, actually, they've used harp harmonics here and you know, like a really quiet piccolo and something else. And they've got a tone color out of these three instruments and I didn't know it was possible to do that. So it's kind of this like geeky level of information that you never stop learning and you get that from score reading. Um, if you're not good at reading music, as I said before, you don't necessarily have to understand everything that's going on at every moment. I very rarely read a score and know everything that's happening. You know, I kind of big picture it. 
Um, I'll listen to the music and I'll let it sort of wash over me. And I'll be picking out details and I might need to go, you know, several times in order to get what I want. But don't worry that you don't understand everything that's on the page all at once because I don't think very few people do. Um, but you can still get a lot out of score reading that way. Um, YouTube has hundreds of thousands of scores with the music attached. So you can watch the score and listen to the music. Um, if you haven't done a lot of score reading, I mean, if you want to jump in with, with full orchest orchestral works, that's fine. But you might want to start with smaller pieces, you know, so a trio, so that you're only looking at three instruments or a string quartet or something like that. But it is absolutely the most instructive way of learning orchestration because you start to pick up what combinations of instruments at what dynamics, you know, at, at, at what, what, what expressive notes the, the, the composer's given. You know, it, it starts to really deconstruct how orchestration works as an art. Um, there's also a site called issue.com and um, a lot of contemporary composers upload their scores there. So if you're particularly interested in works that combine extended techniques or um, classical instruments with uh, electronic instruments. There's lots of scores on there that are really interesting. They don't have the music, but you can you know, use your streaming service and then read the score that way. That can be really, really helpful. I use it a lot. And then Imslip is um, kind of wiki for scores. So it's a repository of all of the um, public domain scores. So you can download hundreds of thousands of things and, you know, print them off if you want, scribble on them, and, and sit, start to deconstruct how the music is, is put together and why particular things sound the way they do at particular parts of the music. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm so sorry that, Cuba, that we haven't been able to get the tech working properly. I was going to show you a few things. I would love to get into how to program VSTs for realism um, in more depth, but that would take um, an entire session on its own. So for now... Um, I would just say that um, sample libraries and VST, VSTs are instruments that need to be learned. They won't sound realistic straight out of the box. So if you play a string note, for example, on your VST, it will have you know, quite an abrupt attack and an abrupt stop, and that is very unlike anybody playing a real string instrument. So you need <coughs> to learn how to shape them. The more you understand how the instruments sound in real life, the better you'll be able to shape them in your door and your VST. Um, but, yeah, without me being able to demonstrate, just to let you know the basics of it, um, we do a lot of manipulation of CC controllers. So for, a stri for that string line, for example, a, s uh, a string player playing a line, if I've given them no other instruction, they will quite naturally sort of crescendo into that note a little bit if it's a held string note. They will um, increase their vibrato, their expression along that note, and then back off as they come off it. And there will also probably be a little swell in dynamic. It will get a little louder in the middle and towards the end, even though I might not have indicated that in the score, because that is the way that string players learn how to play. So if I have a string note that I am writing in my door and I want it to sound realistic, and I haven't told them to you know, not use vibrato, I haven't told them to keep a straight tone, I will manipulate my CC controller to kind of mimic that. So I will have a swell and, and fade off of my volume, of my modulation, of my expression. And I'll either record that in with faders um, or I will draw it in or use a breath controller sometimes. But I'll do that for every note in the piece. And so there is so much manipulation of the MIDI information that we have in order to get our um, mock-ups to sound realistic. None of, again, none of it's particularly difficult, but there's just like a lot of detail. And the more you understand how real instruments sound, so the more score reading you've done, the more you can mimic that in the door world. Um, we often also layer articulations in libraries for particular effects. So if we want a very sort of strong attack um, at the beginning of a string note, for example, uh, I might find that the Mercato patch in my library isn't attacky enough for me, so I might layer it with a staccato patch and then just use the beginning of that note. Um, so layering articulations of, of libraries is, is something that happens very often. But yeah, just know for now, although I'm sorry I can't show you in more detail, um, that creating that realism um, involves a lot of manipulation of MIDI. Um, and we do lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of automation before we even think about bouncing things to audio and EQing and, and doing everything else that you might do if you were mixing. Um, yeah, I've talked already about some of the surprising parallels between orchestrating and mixing. Um, I think if you are watching a conductor, they are live mixing that orchestra, which is another thing, you know, a good point to keep in mind. They are moment to moment balancing that orchestra's dynamic overall 
um, and they are also deciding what tone they want. So they are bringing up the shimmer on the violins. They are asking the timpani to play more dramatically. They are asking the tuba to play a little bit more quietly. You know, they are mixing that orchestra as you're going in. And that's why when you, when you, if you've ever been to recording sessions for um, orchestras, they put nothing between the conductor and the desk. They just, you know, there's no compression, there's no EQ, there's nothing. They let the conductor do everything and they just take a feed. And that's what gets used because the conductor's doing that work. You know, as well as keeping the orchestra in time, they are very much affecting the overall sound of that orchestra moment to moment. And that's why conductors vary so much between the performances. Um, yeah, we talked about balancing the orchestra and tone colours. Um, yeah, and as I said, if you already know how to mix, then you already have some orchestral skills that you probably didn't realise, and I think that's really exciting to know. Um, notation software, I will talk about quickly. If you are learning to um, orchestrate, you will at some point need to know notation software. Um, Finale is the program most commonly used in the States. Here we use Sibelius or Dorico. Dorico, I think, is going to become the industry standard in the next five years or so. Um, I've started using it almost all the time. I find it much more musicianly, much more intuitive than Sibelius. Um, and I know a lot of composers and orchestrators who've moved to it in the last few years. Um, but whatever works for you. Um, there are free cut-down versions, Sibelius first and Dorico SE, so feel free to get started with those and... And, and see what you can learn if you do want to get into orchestrating. There's also a program called MuseScore, which has a lot more capability than either Dorico, um, SE, or Sibelius First. However, there's kind of a ceiling to its capability, and although you can do more than you can with the free programs, you'll find that at some point you won't be able to do all the things that you need to, to produce um, professional standard orchestral scores. So I don't know any orchestrators who use that as their main um, software but it, it might be very helpful to you as you're learning. Um, Logic and other doors will have notation software included, and you probably know about that. Use it if you want, but please be aware that you're only going to be able to produce a kind of like draft of what you're doing. It's not going to be enough for um, professional use. And there's also going to be a couple of issues that might arise that if you don't understand how orchestral instruments are written for, you might come into problems like transposing instruments which I, I don't have time to go but let me just show you quickly actually because um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting and also this is important if you're ever going to use a door for your software um, so if we look at this part again okay come on sorry so if you see here this trumpet note this first trumpet note don't worry if you don't read music because you should still be able to understand what I'm saying um, this first trumpet note is an E, and so that's great. When that trumpet sees that note, they will play, an, well they, when they play that note, they will play an E. So that's written as an E. If I go to my trumpet part, ooh, where is it? That's not an E, that's an F sharp. And that's correct. And that is because the trumpet is a B-flat transposing instrument, and I'm not going to go into all of the history of why that is so. There are some logical and some illogical reasons why there are transposing instruments. But if you're not aware that the trumpet is a transposing instrument and you produce your score in logic and then you give it to your trumpet player, they will play notes that you don't expect. So just don't worry about the hows and whys, but just know, you know, if you are using the notation software in your door, just be really careful because there are things that can trip you up, and if you're not expecting them... Um, yeah, it can be really annoying. Right, okay. Um, and then just a very quick note on doors in general, um, just before we finish. Um, I started doing orchestral work in Ableton, and that was fine up until a point. And I would always say, you know, the door that works for you the best is the one that you know the best. So absolutely use whatever door you already use at the moment. Um, but at some point, because I was working with big orchestral templates and because we need to do so much manipulation of MIDI, um, I switched to Cubase, which has a lot more sophisticated MIDI editing software, uh, sorry, capability. So, you know, I'm not suggesting that you all rush out and change your doors, but just be aware that at some point you might want to if you get really into this. And definitely in film and television, um, the most common doors are Cubase and Logic. And if you're going to be doing orchestral recording sessions, then it's always Pro Tools. 
So at some point, if you want to, to record with an orchestra, or you're going to be working with a director who's recording with an orchestra, you'll need to know enough Pro Tools to be able to um, do a session with your click tracks, because film and television is usually to click, and with your mock-ups and your, your stems from those mock-ups. Um, so yeah, again, don't rush out and buy Pro Tools now if you don't already have it, but just be aware for future-proofing, if you are going to get into the industry in a bigger way, at some point you'll need to know that. Um, yeah, that's my... That's, that's everything I had to say, I think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, and there, sorry, one more thing. There are, as I said, I'll make this available to everyone. There's lots of resources at the end of this, um, some information about budgeting um, and hopefully some other things that will be helpful to you. Yeah, so. <laughs> sorry. Um, Sorry, don't, don't <laughs> um, thank you so much. Mm. That was absolutely You're phenomenal. Welcome. I feel like I'm going to be processing that for about two days. <laughs> yeah. I told you there was a lot of detail. There was. But none of it's difficult. No. It's all, yeah, exactly. It's Just all. give yourself some time and no. yeah, it's all achievable. It was brilliant. You can all become orchestrators if that's what you want to do. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank um, you for having me. We're actually going to take the opportunity while Helen's here mm. to um, for people to ask questions. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to selfishly start because mm. one Please came ask through on oh, the YouTube. internet question. On the internet. <laughs> yeah, we had one on the street. Um, so that will give everyone a chance to think mm. for a moment if you've got any burning questions mm -hmm. for Helen while she's here, while we've got her in the room, <laughs> and you don't have to pursue her on the internet to find Which, out what you want to but know. Although my, my email address is on this, so if you, there although is you something that isn't covered and you want to speak to me, feel free. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, okay, so um, from over here, I'm going to try and say it as loud as I can so it picks up on the mic. Mm. Um, so let's see. Um, so Steve Crozier Hi, asks, Steve. Um, I'm interested in knowing where Helen finds the best sampled instruments. Which libraries mm -hmm. are great for the kind of work you okay, do? Okay, yeah. So samples are like any kind of plug-in thing. You know, it's a rabbit hole that you can fall into. And as I said, you can spend thousands of pounds on sample libraries. Um, and a lot of them are really, really good. Um, I would say... Um, if you're starting out, as I, as I mentioned before, start with the ones that your door has and some of the free ones um, and then see how far you get with them. Uh, and then once you want to start um, working with your own, there are a few companies that you probably want to look at. Um, Spitfire is one. They do some really great sample libraries. Um, Cinematic Studios is another. They do, um, it's a small Australian company, really friendly, really helpful. They do a great string library, a great brass library, a great wind library. Um, there's a, a company called... Uh, oh, Orchestral Tools do lots of good ones. Um, 8DO do really good ones. There are lots and lots of different sample libraries. If you join some of the Facebook groups online, that can be really helpful. There will be a lot of discussion about what libraries are good for what kind of music. But my word of warning with that is there's also a lot of kind of posturing about, you know, you need to have this library and my music's better because I have this library. That's not true. You know, it's not true. You can do so much with, you know, I, I only have a few sample libraries, you know, because I... I haven't got to the point where I wanted to spend a lot more money. So I use Cinematic Studios for my brass and my um, my strings. Um, I use individual percussion libraries because it's, it's quite difficult to find an overall percussion library because, as I said before, there are so many different kinds of percussion instruments. Um, and I also quite often use East West. So East West can be great when you're starting out because they are um, an older company. So... They're kind of frowned upon a little bit because people think that their sample libraries are a little bit out of date, and they sort of are, but they have a huge range, and they run a subscription model. So if you're a student, I think it's £10, and if you're not, it's £20 a month, and you can um, opt in or out of that subscription whenever you want, but you have access to all of their instruments. So it can be a great way of like playing with things and you know starting to find the sort of brass sound that you like or the string sound that you like. Um, but yes, there are some recommendations in this further resources. But yeah, those would be the companies that I would look at first, I think. Fabulous. I hope that, hope that helped. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Mm. Um, open the floor. Hands in the air. Who's got a question? <laughs> no questions. No questions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, hi. Um, when you're talking about notation software, mm. do you think about Dorico? Yes. Uh, is that something that you fully uh, produce from start to finish in, or would you producing another door and then translate it into Oh, actually, yes. It's, thank you for asking that because I meant to bring that up and we just ran out of time a little bit. So um, 
writing for most orchestrators at this point in time is a two-step process. So we either notate our scores fully in Dorico or Sibelius, and then we do our mock-ups in um, our software, in our door with our sample libraries, or vice versa. Um, you can absolutely bring the MIDI from your door into Sibelius or Dorico, but at the moment, you need to do so much manipulation that it kind of makes it easier to just do it from scratch if you're quick with notation software. So you have to, if there's any rhythmic complexity, it takes forever. You know, you need to check all of your articulations, all of your dynamics. So at the moment, we do it as a two-step process, most people. Um, however, we're moving towards a world, I think, in which seamless integration between door and notation software is, you know, we can see it as a possibility. Um, and your best bet for that is going to be um, Cubase and Dorico because they're both owned by Steinberg. Dorico already has a lot more door features than Sibelius has. Um, you can operate it as a mini door. And there are orchestrators I know who don't do, do their own mock-ups. Um, they will work with people to do those. So they'll just do notation. Um, but they'll do a little bit of kind of Dory sort of stuff, and they use um, Dorico for that. But I think, oh, I can't tell how, how far off it is, but it's tantalizingly close. I think in the next five years, um, with Steinberg at least, um, there will be a seamless integration between door and notation software. So you'll be able to either notate and have it appear in your door or vice versa. Um, so yeah, I, I think... 10 years from now, I'll probably be speaking to orchestrators who are amazed that we ever did it as a two-step process. And that would be great because yeah. it's going it's to save us lots of time. But for now, it is kind of two things. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Great. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, I have another question from Steve. Sure. Oh, Steve. <laughs> okay, Steve says, I'm curious about the film scoring conventions mm -hmm. that differ from mm. traditional notation. Mm -hmm why the big time signatures mm -hmm. and especially always writing in c yeah note after all these are presumably musicians that are used to traditional scoring mm -hmm. slash notation yeah they are um so there are the giant time signatures um is part of a set of conventions for writing in film scores um, that are all to do with making things as clear as possible because as i explained before Recording sessions for orchestras are hugely expensive. And so anything that slows that session down, any time you're going to get a musician putting their hand up going, I don't know what's happening here or what's this mark mean or whatever, you know, that, that's an issue. Um, so we put in giant time signatures, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, time signatures, um, so that uh, the conductor can be sort of looking between cues and they know exactly what's going on with the count at any moment. Um, they probably don't actually need to be as giant as we use, but you know, people have just got used to putting them in giant, and because they're used to seeing them giant, they now want to see them giant all the time. But yeah, that is basically a time-saving device, so you never have to think about what the count is. The open key thing, um, so it's, it, it began in Hollywood scores. Um, there was a period in film score history where um, a lot of music changed key, changed tonality throughout the music very, very fast. Um, and some orchestrators found that it was so difficult for the musicians because, you know, they, they, they had a, a key signature for, for one key, but there were so many accidentals because they were moving around into different keys. Um, it was just easier to write the whole thing in open key. Um, and now, because that's become the convention, that's what musicians expect. Um, it's partly so that you can look at any part of that music without seeing any of the rest of that music. So if you are, if the conductor says, can we pick this up at bar... Four three five. Um, although it's not a hassle for a musician to look back and just double check what key signature they're in, it means that they don't have to think about that. And that millisecond of not thinking about it saves enough time in recording sessions that people have, have decided to keep doing that. Um, so that's why every accidental is notated individually. Um, so you don't have to worry about what key you're in. You don't have to remember what accidentals you're going to be using. They will be written out for you. Um, and as with any convention, once it becomes a thing, it's kind of, it's really hard to walk back from that. So if you suddenly had a piece of music that was in key, it would take longer for your musician. Just not, not very long, because there's still professional musicians who read other music in keys. Um, but it takes long enough in a session that you just have this like moment of confusion. And anything that can eliminate moments of confusion in film scoring, recording sessions is considered desirable. Um, you will sometimes find that if you've written for a small ensemble or if you are recording a solo part, that even if it's for a film, that might be notated with a traditional key um, in, in the signature. Um, but if you're doing a big orchestral piece, yeah, absolutely, open key, open key. 
always open case. I hope that answers Steve's question. Steve says thank you very much. Yeah, it's very welcome. <laughs> Any last questions? Any burning questions? Yeah. Is everyone just processing the <laughs> parcel? Oh, yeah. um, I'd be interested to hear you speak on if um, you have a, a piece that's combining kind of orchestral music with uh, electronic mm. elements, yeah. but it's still a, like a real orchestra, mm. how that process might differ in each um, so if it's a recording session, so if you're going to be working with a full orchestra and you have some synth in there, you would usually have the synth as what we call pre-records. So that synth would be, um, you'd have it in your Pro Tools session as a separate um, stem from all of your other orchestral sessions. And then you probably wouldn't feed it to your musicians, but your conductor might have it in their, in their ears. Um, so all the musicians would have a click normally. Um, and sometimes they feed musicians bits of the music depending on, you know, if there's something they really need to hear. But yeah, anything that isn't going to be recorded in that room, you'll have available to you as a separate track. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, that feels like a good place to rest. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Helen. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. <laughs> a PDF mm. document so if you want to take that away today um, then that is possible I will also be asking you for a digital copy if that's okay of course I'm all um, about digital which we will in make open key no yes, time to <laughs> <laughs> uh, which we will make available on our discord mm. server on our special channel that we've called we move uh, which will be available to anyone it's a public server and uh, you can hop on to discuss the sessions as we move through them from one week to the next but also we will ha be having like a little hangout at the end for maybe half an hour at the end of each of these sessions. So in case there are any burning questions that people had in the chat on YouTube that they didn't get to ask in the session. So, um, so yeah, so you can either grab a PDF from Helen now. Yes. Yeah, Sarah? absolutely. Okay, I can give you, yeah, um, or I can give you the link to it, whichever yes. you prefer. Um, mm. And, uh, and we will link it on discord. Mm. Uh, in the meantime, um, can we just have a massive thank you and round of applause? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So much for coming. Fantastic. Um, so thank you all for joining us here IRL and thank you for joining us URL um, it's been a real treat to have everyone um, present and uh, and it was so lovely also to be watching online to see how people were enjoying the presentation oh good that's so, good <laughs> yes we had lovely attendance great um, so the next one will be next week and it will actually be Helena who is here um, who will be um, leading a phenomenal um, session with L Acoustics um, mm. and we will be streaming that as with each of these sessions live as well. So um, if you've enjoyed today, then number one, let us know because we like praise. Um, but number <laughs> two, please do come along to each of the sessions. Every single one of them will be free. It's free to access via streaming and with playback. You will be able to find them on our YouTube channel afterwards in case there was anything you missed. Mm. Um, but also, if you want to attend IRL, that is also free as long as you book, as long as you tell us you're coming. Um, so yeah, so that's the end for this evening. Thank you so much to everyone who attended. And feel free to have a little chat mm. and I will jump on Discord. Mm. So, okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Thanks. And the Discord link is in the chat, you YouTubers. And for those of you in the room who'd like a drink, there's a fridge there. Nice. <laughs> I'd love a drink. Yeah, my mouth went. Yes. White wine or red? Oh, white would be great. My mouth went completely.